So my name's Stephen McDonald. I'm Nikki Skulls Robertson. And, and welcome. This is actually the second of these uh, these uh, workshops, yep. um, and we had the first one on Sunday afternoon, and uh, we had about 35 people in the in the um, audience in the room then, and we had 240 people, 240 people online, uh, listening to a, a a series of presentations, really about what's going on uh, in research and and. I guess the, the, the key thing is, is why has all this happened and, and what these sessions are, they've been organised by, by something called Beat CKD, which is uh, a collaboration between a number of nephrological organisations, but effectively there's a, a consumer advisory board uh, who met and one of the really strong pieces of feedback we got from our earlier workshops was people were dying to find out, quite literally in some yes. cases, but people were very, very keen to find out what was going on in the world of, of, of research that there was impossible to read journal articles and no other way to find out. And so the board um, met and generated a whole lot of list of topics and we took the top few off and, and asked people to speak. And that's how we came to be here. That's right. And we'd like to thank, we've had a bit of support for this from Baxter. Um, and it's just fantastic. The one on Sunday was just great. It was inspiring to have that many people and stories shared were, were awesome. So I think first up, oh, there's an email for the questions. You guys don't have to email though. You can ask them direct. We'll have microphones going around. Um, but for the, the people joining on the web, this is the um, sending email questions to Stephen would be fantastic and we'll ensure that we try to get those in as well included. So... Do you want me to introduce Richard? Or? You go, Richard, if that's okay. all right. So, uh, the, the first um, speaker is, is uh, Richard Kitching, Professor Richard Kitching, um, uh, or Richard. Uh, and, and Richard uh, is really a jack of all trades, and I say that in a, uh, in a very positive way, because he's one of the people that when we thought about who actually is a kidney specialist, a nephrologist, knows clinical research, but also does and is involved a lot in what we call basic laboratory research uh, around the bench. Uh, he is involved actively in all of it and uh, we thought was in a great position to really give a, a presentation on the, the, the breadth of the current landscape, what is happening and what are the highlights of and the challenges for research in kidney disease in Australia and around the world. Richard. Well, thank you very much. I, I would like to thank the Beat CKD, CKD Consumer Advisory Board um, for inviting me. And I was thinking about this talk um, yesterday and today and this morning, and I realised that I have talked about research, often my own research, but sometimes other people's research, uh, in Australia and around the world for the last 15 or so years, and I'm not entirely sure whether I've been as nervous as I am now talking about uh, to this audience. So please uh, forgive me if I don't uh, meet your expectations. Um, my, as Steve said, my background, um, I'm a New Zealander, um, but don't hold that against me. Um, but I trained in New Zealand and came to start a research career and a clinical career in Australia. And I accidentally, I'm an adult nephrologist, but I accidentally fell into paediatric nephrologist when my, when nephrology, when one of my colleagues went to have a third child and had her third and fourth child. So they wanted a locum for a year, and that was in 1999. Um, so I'm still there. Um, but I was chair of the ANZSN Scientific Program and Education Committee, but more recently um, I've been co-opted to be the co-chair of the ANZSN Research Advisory Committee, and from that probably a member of the Kidney Health Australia um, Research Committee. So I'm going to touch on a few things. Um, I think I'll skip fairly briefly over the research spectrum and research landscape in general, but give some sort of brief examples of some of the research that's going on and has gone on recently. And there is a lot of research going on in Australia, and I'll start by apologising if I'm not tilting it the way people would like it, but I've just tried to pick out some things that are happening that might be interesting or exciting to some of you. So I should start, this is a complicated slide, you don't need to understand or do the detail, but effectively, in the sort of 2000s, people sort of thought, well, the research should proceed in a linear sort of way. You should make this sort of big discovery or work out what's going on in a condition, make a new drug, and you go from what they call bench to bedside, and you do some clinical research, and you bring it to practice, and then you have an impact, and that's sort of how it works. Um, and so there was sort of this linear idea that you should start somewhere and go somewhere, hence this word bench to bedside. But I think that's a bit out of date, and it's a bit old-fashioned, and it doesn't reflect the reality of research practice. And there's lots of these types of diagrams around. I've just picked one out. 
But the two things that are different is the recognition that the patient or the consumer is actually at the centre of what we should be doing, whether it's really fundamental research or highly applied research, but also it's sort of what they call an iterative process. You know, we should talk, we should talk backwards and forwards between each other. So if I was going to go for that first one where, a, where there was a line, it would be sort of full of a maze of arrows where you know, I would talk to Stephen about what's going on epidemiologically, for example. I just pick Stephen because he's walking around. Um, but you know, those sorts of things. So it's really more a complex but iterative process where we can hopefully inform each other. Um, you know, just like we shouldn't be doing a clinical trial on something if we don't really understand there's a good basis for doing it. Uh, we shouldn't be going off on tangents in basic research where it's never going to have any relevance to patients, except to say, sometimes you can discover really interesting things that way. And kidney researchers in Australia, in Australia should work in all of these areas, right across the spectrum. And I have to say, and I'm not just saying this, because I don't think I'm prone to exaggeration, but kidney research in Australia is certainly a widely respected internationally, and punch, we do punch above our weight uh, as, as a country in this regard, or Australasia, I should say, being especially being New Zealander. So I got asked to talk about the landscape, and I wasn't quite sure whether it was the sort of funding landscape or the research landscape, and I think it's largely the research landscape, but I will say a couple of things because it's highly relevant to what's going on at the moment. Funding and therefore the research landscape is changing massively right now. Uh, the NHMRC gives out about $750,000 million a year, and there's this thing called the Medical Research Future Fund that was set up about three or four years ago. And in a few years, the MRFF will give out more money than the NHMRC. So we've just got this huge funding stream coming online. The NHMRC itself has changed in the way it does research or funds research. And over the years, the rules have evolved to favour senior people having lots of grants. And one of the things that we're all grappling with as senior and junior people uh, is that the new funding rules will hopefully favour young, dynamic people rather than old, clapped out people like myself, and also uh, do something significant to address the gender imbalance in research funding in Australia. So we'll see what happens, but that's their intent. The MRFF is very interesting because they set these priorities and then a number of things happen, but the minister has a lot of input on, into what actually gets called for. And that's why Kidney Health Australia and others, and many others, have been lobbying the minister and the government about priorities and those sorts of things. And recently they looked to set their future priorities and they asked for submissions. And they didn't say just write what you want, they actually gave you a series of things to select from. And the ANZSN has been trying to work closer with KHA and I think that's a great thing where two organisations with overlapping and very similar goals work together and form a more united voice. And this is what we ended up saying, we ended up emphasising clinical quality, quality registries, drug repurposing, in other words, using drugs that, or working to use drugs that might kind of work for other things for kidney disease, um, partnering with industry. And as I said, we didn't have an open slather sort of choice here. We had a series of choices to make uh, that they gave us. We emphasised the research going across disciplinary because we know that people with, uh, with kidney issues often have other issues in other parts of their body, their heart or their blood vessels, or if they have a transplant, they have immune system issues because they've got a transplant, or if they've got a kidney disease, they have that as well. Um, consumer engagement, we emphasise, and I think that's, I know that's highly appropriate, and we also emphasise better delivery of healthcare to regional areas, and that included Indigenous health. Um, so we suggested that, again, we had a series of choices to make, we suggested that they should look to fund partnerships with industry and research collaborators across discipline, and also to fund the next generation of researchers who are the, the single most important uh, resource that we will have in the future in terms of doing research, not necessarily engagement and involvement. So with that sort of brief discussion about what might be happening politically, it's not my scene, um, but it's probably quite important. Um, I want to just highlight a few things that are going on in various areas of nephrology. And I know I'm not going to spend most of my time talking about uh, a consumer engagement, although that's critical and it's been, it's been appropriately given a lot of emphasis at this meeting. But I do want to highlight the song or standard outcomes in nephrology pro program that's international but led here in Australia. And it comes from the issue that, you know, maybe some of the things we're measuring in trials and studying actually aren't that relevant to consumers. So shouldn't we all try and get agreement on what are the critical things and critical outcomes we're going to measure? So it involves consumers, patients, carers, clinicians, and it's an iterative, in other words, a several rounds of process where, where you try and determine 
what are the critical important things that have to be measured or looked at in almost all trials? You know, what are the things that are probably important and what are the things that are sometimes important? And currently, there's an expanding list of, uh, of conditions and areas that are being studied in, in song, and they include hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, transplantation, kids, polycystic kidney disease, and glomerulonephritis. So there's a series of rounds that go on, and some of you may have been involved. Um, and at the end, the aim is to come up with a, a standardised, agreed-to list with sig very significant consumer input and to propose that those are the kind of things we should be trying to work towards. And this is unpublished information, so, but it's very preliminary. And Simon Carter, who's doing his PhD on this, show, showed me this and, and shared this with me. This is an example of one of the early rounds of the glomerulonephritis song, where, where, where the process goes by, we look at, or, or, or the, the, the Simon and others, look at what sort of things are important, and then further rounds are done to get a list of those you know, three domains that are critical, important, less important, but possible. And so that's, I think, a very, it's, it's going to be very relevant internationally, and it's run here from Australia, and we've got, well, we, the process has large involvement of consumers, which I think is very important. What about clinical trials? Clinical trials are a little bit different. They sort of answer, a, if they're done well, they can answer a big question and change practice. And the classical example of a kidney trial in Australia that really changed practice was a trial called the IDEAL trial, which really looked at whether or not people who are otherwise feeling well should sort of start dialysis a bit earlier to stay in shape or should wait till their kidney function goes down a bit. And you couldn't do this in the States and many other places, but you could do it in Australia. So the trial was done randomising or dividing people into starting a little bit earlier or a little bit later. And this is, these are the mortality rates, and they're exactly the same. So what it showed, really, is you might... There's not much point if you're feel, otherwise feeling well and there's no other good reason to start dialysis. There's not much point in starting particularly early. And what's that done is it saved years of dialysis. It saved people being on dialysis for, 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 for quite some time. And therefore, because people are not having to do dialysis to start dialysis early, um, it's better, a lot more well-being, and it's also saved millions of dollars. And this is not just... Uh, in Australia, but internationally. This has largely been applied internationally. So following that trial, the way I understand it, though I wasn't involved in the trial, uh, it was decided there should be a kidney trials network, and that led to the formation of the Australian Kidney Trials Network, and this is Carmel Hawley, who was just awarded the Priscilla Kincaid Smith a a KHA Medal for outstanding and, and consistent contribution to, to kidney disease work. Uh, and these are the trials that have been underway or, or done over the last 10 years or so. So it's a really powerful... Uh, well-organised kidney trials network uh, that is the envy of many countries around the world. I've heard Carmel talk to the Americans about how to do this properly. So it's a really great resource uh, and there are ongoing trials being proposed and perhaps the most recent trial as an example is something called the Best Fluids Trial and this is a transplantation trial and it's, it's, it's a relatively simple question. Does using a particular type of intravenous fluid, which is used as a standard in the first sort of 48 hours after transplantation, does it make a difference on how well your kidney works to start off with, and therefore maybe later on as well? So it's what they call a pragmatic trial, and I won't go into the detail of what that exactly means, but effectively it means it's more likely to be generally relevant. Most people are in it, or most people are eligible to be in it. It's registry-based, so it uses the ANSTATA registry, which some of you will know about. It's a registry of people with end-stage kidney disease in Australia. It's, again, one of the envies of the world. Uh, it's the arguably the best-kept uh, and most complete registry in the world. And so the trial taps into the registry to get high value and extra information. It's double-blind, which means that the doctors and the clinicians and the patients don't know which fluid's been given, which is a good thing because it takes out to a large degree what's known as the placebo effect or bias, and it's also randomised. It's just comparing these two different types of fluid on early kidney, uh, and early donor kidney transplantation. And because it was well organised, and partly because it was taken up by AKTN, it was fully funded this year by the Medical Research Future Fund and one of the calls that they made. So we'll be able to make, here in Australasia, be able to make a significant contribution to the world literature on how we should treat people who have a kidney transplant. Uh, it's well designed, it's well powered, and it's been met with some enthusiasm because I saw the slide, and I can't remember the exact number, uh, but it's well on target for recruitment already, even after only a few months. So it's really going very well, and it's a good example of some research that's happening uh, that, will, that most many units are involved in, 
and we should be able to get an answer to what's going on. Then we go to more sort of what people call basic science, which I have to say is a word I don't like. I like sort of something more complicated, like fundamental research or early translational research or something. But anyway, we'll call it basic science. So if you could grow a new kidney, that would be a good thing. Uh, and so Melissa Little, for a number of years, at least since I've known her, has been working on this stuff. And basically what she can do now, she's from Melbourne, what she can do now is take out cells from a person and reprogram them, turn them back in time and make them what they call pluripotent, which means they can kind of do anything. And if you put the right recipe together, and the recipe is complicated, you can make them start to grow into little kidneys. So at the moment, she can grow these things called organoids, which have many of the features of little kidneys, but they're only about half a centimetre. But to actually grow something that looks like and starts to behave like a kidney from scratch is an amazing thing. And it was so amazing that the world's top scientific journal, Nature, actually accepted it very quickly and put it on the cover. And that was a couple of years ago. There have been, as far as I'm aware, four uh, studies in Nature on kidneys, excluding kidney cancer, in the last three years, and two of them have come from Australia. So not only eventually could we maybe grow a kidney, but it's got more immediate effects. So we know that medications can affect the kidney negatively. We know that medications can work on the kidney in a good way. But it's very laborious, laborious to work out what sort of medications might do that when you're screening hundreds of thousands of drugs. And she's setting up a system where you can grow these tiny little organoids, organoids and test what the medications might be doing without having to inject them into animals and pretend that's actually what really happens in humans, or perhaps without putting humans at risk in these sorts of studies. Also, and some of you may have heard about this in another session, you could take cells from people with genetic kidney diseases and see how they start behaving when you grow them into these little kidneys, and then test treatments on them and understand what's going on. So it's really got a lot of, uh, a lot of traction, a lot of um, benefit potentially from this. I'm going to turn to the immune system partly, and please indulge me because that's what I'm interested in. So I'm going to talk a little bit what I'm interested in. And I thought I'd start by showing you a sea urchin and a fish because it's important. So basically there are two broad parts of the immune system. And sea urchins have lots and lots of senses to sense infection and danger, but when those senses go off, the, their immune system you know, gets angry and, and starts to fight it. But it sort of does it in the same way each time and it doesn't have any memory. So the same thing will come along and the same thing will happen. But as we evolved into bony fishes, and these things are lampreys, they're actually there for a purpose, not just to look gross. Uh, they're actually at the threshold of when this happens. So here's the threshold, and this is the fully, fully developed, developed immune system. Fish recognise, and we do as well, we recognise foreign invaders as proteins, or what we call antigens, more specifically, and that's T cells and B cells, and you may have heard of antibodies and all those sorts of things. So that's what makes our immune system specific. And that's really good because it gives it powerful, it makes it very powerful, it gives it memory so it can remember, and it gives it specificity. In other words, we can specifically recognise one type of bug while leaving things like ourselves alone. So this is a slide, this is a picture from an immunology textbook, and I will spend a minute explaining it because Normally, we have an active response to infections, an infective response to cells that have gone rogue, but to ourselves, or hopefully to grafted organs if we need one, we have a deficient response. So the real problem here, currently, for people with immune kidney disease or with transplants, is we need to work out how to give them treatments that will shift this active response away from rejection towards acceptance, and in those people who have immune diseases of the kidney and other places, shift autoimmunity towards tolerance. The problem currently is the medications that we give for transplants and for immune diseases also shift protective immunity towards infection and tumour immunity, positive, you know, dealing with rogue cells, to increasing the risk of cancer. So we're sort of attacking the good bits of the immune system as well as the bits we want to interfere with. So with that in mind, what I would call the grand challenge in sort of basic research or fundamental research in both transplantation and these immune autoimmune diseases where the body recognises the self and becomes confused is to try and reset the immune system and make them tolerant to the kidney or to the bits of yourself that you've gone wrong with and try and do it without these current non-specific treatments that kind of settle things down but the side effects include infection risk, particularly with corticosteroids or steroids, prednisolone, metabolic effects and perhaps later on, in some situations, the risk of cancer. And I should add, coming back to the sea urchin, 
lots of conditions that were previously thought of being sort of non-immune have inflammation as an important component. So if we understand, for instance, in diabetic kidney disease, what, what role and how inflammation plays a role, we might be able to additionally target it. So one of the other papers, or the other paper from Australia that in kidney disease came from my group, and it's complicated, and I could spend half an hour trying to explain it and probably fail. But essentially, what we did, we showed in a rare condition, and possibly relevant to many other conditions, how the body's normally protected in some people, but not others. And this is by these cells called regulatory cells, which are kind of the police persons, police force of the immune system, and they keep autoimmune cells quiet. They're actually being used in transplantation in a trial at the moment. They're taking, in, in, in Europe, they're taking people's uh, regulatory cells out, expanding them, and putting them back in at the time of transplant. But what we're able to show is that if you make these highly specific, they're much more powerful and potent, and we hope that that will inform how we can better treat and restore tolerance in people in the future. So we talked, I've talked a bit about sort of the drivers of things that drive kidney injury, and I put the slide up at a pediatric nephrology meeting in 2004, so it's a bit old-fashioned, but it kind of still sort of tells you what happens. The kidney gets insulted, and if it's not too bad or it's only a single insult, you get this repair and things resolve. But then in some situations, even when you take the original insult away, there's just this slow progression of kidney scarring that happens, what we call fibrosis or scarring, and bits of the kidney stop working, you tend to leak protein, the waste products go up. So as well as, it, as, well as dealing with these sorts of things, maybe we could slow down progression and people with CKD could just remain with CKD stage one or two, relatively mild kidney impairment, without progressing. And so an example, I just wanted to show you an example of commercialisation, which I think is uh, we should all sort of look to do um, and, and, and look to be involved if we can. Darren Kelly is a professor at, uh, at, um, at uh, Melbourne University and he trained as a scientist in kidney disease, particularly in diabetes, but also in scarring. And he discovered and worked out a new drug that could prevent and limit kidney scarring. It does it very well in rats. It looks to be safe in humans in what they call a phase one study. And he wants to combine it with personal signatures in biopsy, blood and urine. So find the right drug for the right person. And this green stuff here is scarring and these are tubules in the kidney. And he wants to slow this process down. And he's just been awarded $22 million from the government's biomedical translation fund. So we hope uh, that in the future, we may be able to slow down the progression of kidney diseases by preventing this abnormal scarring and deposition of stuff. Maybe, and some other things we do is maybe we can also use conventional treatment better. And I put this one slide in very briefly without trying to explain all the details. There was recently a trial in an immune disease called vasculitis that often involves the kidney. And one of the problems with this condition, this is the dose of prednisolone. So this is quite a high dose. This is how much your body makes naturally. So in this, this is how we used to treat people with this condition. 60 milligrams, and after three months, you're still on 15 milligrams. And the trial showed you could give this amount safely without compromising the treatment of the disease, but with much less side effects. This trial came out, it still hasn't been published yet, but it came out in the, in, um, uh, the European meeting, everyone saw it on Twitter, as you do nowadays. And so the next day, I was able to rewrite our protocols for our clinic and say, we're going to do this rather than that. So when the, when the people come with this condition now, I tell them, you're, you're just this year, it's a bad condition to have, but if you were here last year, you'd be getting twice as much prednisolone. Now we know we can safely, safely give you half the amount. And over 100 patients from this trial, the largest trial in this condition ever, came from Australasia. So lastly, I want to mention population-based studies to try and work out how we can work out whether treatments are safe. And in type 2 diabetes, some of the challenges control glucose. We know that controlling glucose can help people feel better, but can also slow down progression of complications, heart, blood vessels, but also kidney diseases. And this is Ben Lazarus, who's a first year advanced trainee in kidney medicine. So he's got his exam, he's got three years of clinical training to go. But he went off when he was a medical student, a junior doctor, he went off to John Hopkins and he did these studies on metformin use. Now metformin's a drug for type two diabetes. And it's a very good drug. It's one of the best ones we've got. It's cheap, it works, it doesn't put on weight, it's got a good side effect profile, except if you've got advanced kidney failure, there's a very small risk of this nasty build-up of acid that happens that can make people very, very sick. So we're a bit scared to use it, and we don't know when we have to stop it. So what he did with his colleagues at John Hopkins 
is he studied more than 75,000 people who were taking metformin. And he was able to show, in what he says, in two real-world clinical settings, unless your EGFR, which, which is a technical term describing how much kidney function you've got, unless your EGFR was less than 30, which is about a third, so unless your kidney function got down to about a third, metformin use appeared to be safe. Now, not many people would use it down that far because we're all a bit scared about harming our patients. But he suggests that this is actually safe in what will be probably the largest ever study of this condition. And I was amused by the editorial because it said, should metformin be first-line therapy? So the same in the journal, one of the world's top uh, clinical uh, um, practice journals, said, should metformin be first-line therapy for patients with type 2 diabetes and chronic disease? And they suggested that informed patients might even decide, which I found quite amusing. I mean, it's, it sort of doesn't need to be written, though, you know, like, is this a new thing, that we should give choices to our, our consumers and patients and let them make decisions? I, I think not, although I do use in my clinical practice occasionally in immune readers, I say, look, you know, if you came with semi-conscious, with a rash and meningitis, bacterial meningitis, we wouldn't have a long conversation what we should do. But in terms of your treatment for vasculitis, here are your choices and let's, let's talk about it. So this, this leads me to my most risky slide and I feel almost a bit nervous suggesting what, what you guys might want to do because you're going to decide yourselves. But I do want to thank you for turning up both online and for people who've come here in person. But I guess, you know, you'll have your own ideas and you'll have thought of this a lot, but I actually really enjoy it when people talk to me about their condition and things they're uncertain about because so many times I wonder, what are they really thinking? You know, do they, are they really happy? You know, did I do that right? Why didn't we connect right there? What's in the background here? So, so try and talk to your clinicians, particularly people you trust. Um, take the chance, if you can, to participate in research. Uh, and I appreciate one of the things we've, we, we think we want to do with KHA eventually is I think in the last session there was a... It was a Tinder for clinical trials? Yeah. I think we wanted something like that, although we didn't call it Tinder for clinical trials. We were a bit more prosaic. Um, but particularly with MRFF and funding, you know, feel free, in fact, particularly via KHA and other bodies, um, feel free to take an advocacy role if you can. And also, depending on how you feel about your condition and how engaged you are and how much time you have and what you're able to do, don't, if you feel OK, don't be shy to, uh, if, you, if you're OK with this, to you know, publicise and talk about kidney conditions kidney disease and, and, and the way it might affect you or other people. So I'm sorry if I've gone on too long, but thank you for your time, and I hope there's been something there for some of you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Richard. That was fantastic. Right. Thank you. Thanks. It was really, really good. Now, has anybody in the room got any questions at the moment for Richard while he's here? No, no, question is, no question is silly, no question is too dumb. Some of the silliest ones that I get are actually the hardest ones to answer and the best questions. So my silly question, Richard, is you mentioned that Australia punches above its weight, and that's great, and we all feel yeah. good about that. Why? Because understanding what we do well is often key to doing it even better. So what is it that we do as Australia and New Zealand, as you told us not to forget them? I think, I don't know, it's a good question. I think... There has probably been over the years, over the 50 or so years of at least ANZSN, um, which has been and, and still is sort of the kind of primary area for people to talk to each other about doing research, and I'm not sure that's the, it's not the whole story, there's been a bit of a spree to core, and people do talk to each other and work together. Uh, and I think also there's been sort of some glues that probably hold research and society together. And it's, this is not my area, but I think ANZ data, for example, and Stephen would like to say this, of course, but I'm not, just, I'm not just saying this. I think, you know, the idea that, that we can all contribute and important things can be worked out by using national platforms and collaborations is an important one. And something that we need, I personally feel we need to do more of, and I guess AKTN, uh, the Kidney Trials Network, is another area that, where that might be useful. But I'd be willing to... What, what's your opinion on it? I don't, I don't really know. I don't know either. I'm just going to remind people online to send their questions in via email because the online thing's about 30 seconds behind. Yeah. The last question I've got is an easy one. How long is it going to take for the organelles you showed to get to being used in people? <laughs> well, you know, this is, this is one of my favourite... This is one of my favourite types of questions because my wife is a dietitian. We sit there on Sunday night and the ABC have what I call the Sunday night breakthrough. And, you know, it always ends up by saying, you know, and there's new hope. The other one, the other one I've told our 
publicity people at Southern Clinical School of Clinical Sciences where we don't use the word new hope for patients. Yeah. Please don't use that anymore. It's such a hackneyed phrase. They always say five to ten years, but that's because what they always say. I think we're some way off, um, to be honest. I would, I would, I've got to be in my bonnet. My family are a family of public relations consultants and politicians, but old style public relations consultants. And I can see the spin that comes in. On the one hand, we have to get our message out and let you guys know what's going on and involve you. But on the other hand, I have seen some really poor examples where the press and the researchers and the publicity people at the university have sort of said things that are kind of over the top. So I'm a bit reluctant. You said that was an easy question. <laughs> I'm a bit reluctant to say that. And I think Melissa would probably know better than I. But I, I don't think we're talking about next year or the year after. I think this is a really long-term project. But the intermediate goals are really important because even just working out better treatments for kidney disease by having to screen thousands of different drugs that are being generated routinely now by testing them on little human kidneys first is a big advance. 